in Chicago attending the funeral of the father of uh, one of our beloved pastors here in the North Central Diocese. And having pastored in that area for six years in the late 80s and in the early 90s, I was already familiar with the famous or the infamous uh, Dan Ryan Expressway. <laughs> Admittedly, the uh, funeral was over at two and my flight was back out at four and I thought that uh, I, since the preacher had just eulogized about whatever you do, do it now and don't be procrastinating, I really thought I was doing pretty good by uh, giving myself two hours to make a 30 minute trip to the airport. For some strange reason, Chicago after 30 years has had the nerve to allow more cars to be on the Dan Ryan Expressway than was there when I last lived there. And so it did take me at least an hour and a half to make a 30 minute journey. But while I was basically sitting there parked uh, with the congested traffic on the Dan Ryan Expressway, the following message appeared on the electronic uh, IDOT or Illinois Department of Transportation sign. Not only did I notice it once, but crawled a little bit further and uh, saw it a second time. And after crawling a little bit further, 30 minutes later, there was another sign. And this is the sign that was uh, broadcast to motorists. It said, don't lose your independence. Drive soberly. Don't lose your independence. Drive sober. And the implication was quite clear that during this Independence Day and Fourth of July weekend, make sure that you drive sober. Less you lose your driver's license and the independent right to drive legally in the state of Illinois. And as you know, throughout this weekend, this nation and July 4th, we celebrate and we affirm that freedom and independence are truly among life's precious commodities. But friends, while we celebrate our independence as a nation and the freedoms we enjoy as a nation, the message this morning is simply this. If you want to talk about liberation, if you want to talk about freedom, did you know that salvation is the greatest liberating reality that any man, any woman, any boy, or any girl could experience in life. I am so glad this morning that God has set you free and God has set me free. But did you know that although salvation, watch this, sets us free from being slaves to sin, the enemy of your soul and the enemy of my soul wants us to be satisfied with being saved, but he still wants us to remain enslaved. Uh, you missed that. You missed that. The devil, since he could not keep by the grace of God, me and you, from coming to Jesus Christ as Savior, he wants us to be okay with being saved but still enslaved and bound by negative behaviors in our lives. He wants you and me to be okay with being satisfied with allowing counterproductive habits in our lives. He wants us to be satisfied with still being dominated and controlled 
with living a life which contradicts now the fact that we have been set free. But I've got good news this morning. I've got good news this morning that the same God who paid the price on Calvary's cross through Jesus for our sins or through his love and grace, the power of God is able. I said the power of God this morning is able to break the strongholds in my life and in your life. For as Apostle Paul declared in Galatians chapter 4, verse 31, he says, So then, brethren, we are not, we are not, we are not children of bondage. And then in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Stand. And this morning, the message is stand, stand, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and don't be entangled or enslaved again with the yoke of bondage. First of all, this morning, first of all, if you and I are to become, or if you and I are to overcome being saved but still enslaved, we first must, uh, first of all, understand and embrace uh, the experience of salvation. It starts with the experience of salvation. And when we say it starts with the experience of salvation, salvation, and if the heart of salvation is you and I, on an individual basis, receiving Christ, as our personal Savior. And my friend, salvation, what salvation does when it comes to freedom, what salvation does when it comes to liberty is that salvation immediately frees us. Yes, it does, from spiritual death and the penalty of sin. And here in our primary passage this morning in uh, St. John chapter 11, Jesus had just performed his latest of miracles. Jesus performed, Jesus performed many miracles throughout his earthly ministry. But the greatest, the greatest, the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed is bringing dead folks back to life. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yes, it was his first miracle. His first miracle was a wedding when he turned water into wine. I said that was his first miracle. Uh, but his greatest miracles were always at funerals. Yes, it was. His greatest miracles were, were always at funerals. And here in uh, John chapter 11, we have the funeral, as it were, of uh, Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. And, uh, and Jesus was notorious for being a disruptive influence at funeral services, yeah, yeah, yes, he was. He, he was always a disruptive influence at funeral services because his presence would always lead to the guest of honor, the deceased, though being brought in physically dead for some reason would inevitably get up walking out uh, on their own party, as it were. Here in our text, the deceased loved one, uh, 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 anytime Jesus was at a funeral, the deceased loved one may have arrived in a hearse. But by the time Jesus got through, he would undeniably uh, allow the deceased to end up walking out under their own power. And my friends, uh, when it comes to this issue of salvation, allow me to remind us that even uh, it says here now in uh, chapter 11, verse 38, that Jesus, uh, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was laying against it, and Jesus told them to take away the stone. And it says in verse 43, now when he had said these words, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Oh, I love every, you know, when they say that, had Jesus not called out all, yeah, had he not just said, Lazarus, 
everybody would have got up from the grave. Everybody would have come out. But Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus. I, 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 I suggest, I suggest, not in the text, but I suggest the reason why he had to use a loud voice uh, uh, to make sure not just that Lazarus heard, but to let all the other dead folks know that he wasn't talking to them right now, okay? <laughs> but Jesus said, and Lazarus come forth, and the Bible says in verse 44, and he who had died came out. And when it comes to salvation, even as Lazarus was fully dead, I need to stop and say he was fully dead. Because some commentators want me and you to believe that Lazarus was just in a coma. And as my brother just said, when you're in a coma, you don't stink. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible says that Lazarus has not only been dead for one day, two days, three days, or four days, stinking big time. Even his own sister said, Jesus, what you doing? We might as well leave uh, brother low, because you know, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, my man stank so bad, his own sister didn't want him no more. Okay, but that's not in the text here. But, 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 but I want you to know that Lazarus was fully dead. But throughout Scripture, God declares that without Christ, just like Lazarus was fully dead and physically dead, did you know that without Christ and before salvation, Salvation, you and I, we were spiritually dead. For even in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, God's word declares, and you he has made a lie. And what does the verse say there? Who were what? Dead. Not just sick, not just having a few problems not just having a few struggles in life, but he made you and I alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. And then look in verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5 says, But God, oh my goodness gracious, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which he hath loved us. And look at verse 5 says, even when we were what? Dead. The Bible makes it clear. Is that outside of Christ, you and I, without Christ, we are spiritually dead. Just like the medical profession has redefined physical death as the absence of activity of the brain, God, listen now, God defines spiritual death as the absence of one's relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. Even as the medical profession, when there is no brain activity, even though there may be artificial means that are causing the lungs to pump, as it were, uh, and the heart to keep going, if there is no brain activity, they, they, they deem the situation as brain death. Well, I want to let you know from the authority of the Word of God is that even though you and I, we may be physically going around moving and doing our thing, the Bible says that spiritually we are dead. When you and I were born, uh, 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 whether you was born in the city or born in the country, somewhere along the line, a live birth certificate may have been issued on your behalf. Spiritually, a stillbirth took place in heaven in God's sight. Uh, oh, you missed that. You missed that. Uh, 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 yes, in City Hall in Kansas City, the, uh, uh, when my mother had me on January 3rd, 1958, they issued a live birth certificate. But in heaven, God issued a stillbirth. Because even though I was physically alive, I was spiritually dead. Uh -huh. yeah. I recently saw one of those online advertisements. And I'm have to admit, I have no idea what they was advertising, but this is what it said. It says, what does your DNA 
say about you? Uh, what does your DNA say about you? Well, I have no idea what my physical DNA says about me, but I do know that without Christ, what my spiritual DNA said about me at birth. Because when it comes to my spiritual DNA without Christ, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And, and so your spiritual DNA, when you was born into this life, says that uh, for all have sinned. Don't make no, make no difference whether you're a good-looking baby or a bad-looking baby. Uh, don't, don't make no difference whether they said, ooh, cootie, 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 you're a pretty baby, or they still looked at you and wondered why you even was allowed to come out your mother's womb, all right? I, I, I want to let you know that the Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, when it comes to our spiritual DNA without Christ, Romans 6, 23 says it's not only for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but the wages of sin is what? Death. That's why a spiritual still birth certificate has to be issued is that the wages of sin is death. When it comes to my spiritual DNA outside of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, the first part of that verse says, For as in Adam, how many die? All die. Everyone who is a descendant of the human race, we come into this life spiritually dead without Christ. But oh my goodness gracious, but at salvation, even as the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth, even as Jesus said to his sisters, or when they worried about whether or not Lazarus was going to be resurrected, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, not just physically dead, but though he that believeth in me, though he were spiritually dead, yet shall he live. And like Lazarus was made alive in Christ, and immediately set free, guess what? He was not only made spiritually alive, but oh, he was set free. Yes, he was. He was set free from the penalty of sin. Uh, yes, when it comes to our spiritual DNA, the Bible says without Christ, we are dead. But uh, Romans 3 to 623 says, but the gift of God is eternal life. The bad news is when it comes to my spiritual DNA without Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 says, yes, for as an item, my Adam all died, but even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Yeah. And, and so we just want to affirm that as believers, yeah. if you know Jesus is your Savior, yeah. oh, this, let this uh, 4th of July season enable you to thank God for what he's done for your life. Yeah. Oh, my goodness, uh, uh, because it was Jesus who said, who the Son has set free. Yeah. Guess what, saints, we are free indeed. Oh, there's an oldest song, there's an oldest song, a chorus from decades ago. I found myself singing to myself. Uh, you know, that's what I've got to do. You know, y'all don't want to hear my singing, but I'm glad I can sing to myself. And the Holy Spirit brought to my, 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 my heart that, that chorus, thank God I am free, free, free from this world of sin. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus, and I've been born again. Hallelujah, I'm saved. Say, say, by his wonderful grace. Thank God I found out he could bring me out and show me the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, man. I, I know I've got to move on, but, but, but I want to remind you that, 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 that if you and I are going to overcome being saved but still enslaved, we have to first of all come to grips with the experience of salvation and the experience of salvation. What salvation does, it 
immediately, immediately, immediately. I said immediately. Freeze us from spiritual death and the penalty of sin. Back to our primary text, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Immediately. He came forth. And when you receive Jesus Christ, for some reason it's in my spirit to remind us, when you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it has to be an individual thing. No, no, no family plans, okay? Uh, you know, I thank God for, 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 uh, for my grandmother, and uh, so I see my cousins good that, 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 that uh, Grandma Leanna Hopkins uh, knew the Lord, but it ain't no family plans, you understand? Just because your grandmother and your grandfather was a part of this church, praise God for your grandmother and grandfather, but that ain't going to help you, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, 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 praise God that you've got a godly uh, uh, mother or father, and even if you don't have a godly mother or father, when it comes to salvation, it is no family plan. Each one individually must receive Christ as their Savior. So salvation immediately frees us from spiritual death and the penalty of sin. But second, 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 there's not only the experience of salvation, but there is the expectation of salvation. And when we say the expectation of salvation, whereas salvation immediately frees us from spiritual death and the penalty of sin, then there is transformation, transformation, transformation. And what transformation does, uh, we, 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 you know, the theological term is sanctification, but, uh, you know, s some of us, we've messed up what sanctification, you know, looks like and what it means and half afraid of, and that's a sanctified church, and, and, and we got all sanctified, you know, we just got all messed up. But anyway, anyway, at the heart of the word sanctification has to do with transformation, okay? And what transformation does, transformation progressively, see, salvation immediately frees us from spiritual death. And the penalty of sin, I no longer have to pay for my sins because Jesus paid it all. We'll celebrate later on all to him. We owe sin that left the crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. But what transformation does is where a salvation is immediately transformation progressively frees us, not just from the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. Because now back here in John 11, verse 44 says, And he who had died came out bound head and foot with grave clothes. Ah, uh huh. That's the problem. That's the problem. So you've been set free? But my man was still bound. Not only he was still bound, he, 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 he was bound, his hands were still bound. His feet were still bound. Uh, the problem was this. He was fully alive. But you know what the problem was? On the outside, he looked like he was still dead. <laughs> uh, he was alive in Christ and through Christ. Uh, but the problem is when you looked at him, he looked like he was still enslaved. Uh, he was alive. It says his face was still wrapped with a cloth. Uh, yes, for all intents and purposes, uh, uh, you know, uh, he looked at that time. Uh, the dead was prepared much like mummies. And so, you know, I'm not sure if you watched the mummy one, mummy two, mummy three, uh, the return of the mummy and the Mommy beats up your daddy and all that other stuff. Uh, you know, y'all yeah, forget, forget that. But, 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 but you know what? You know, on TV, you know how the mummies are. They all, you know, they're they all wrapped up, tangled up and tied up, as it were. 
uh, Lazarus, his, his fully alive, but again, it said his foot was all tied up. His, his hands were all tied up. His, his eye, his face uh, was all tied up. And, uh, and I, I want you to see is that although he was fully alive now, Jesus did not want his miracle going about life. Although saved, he still looked like he was bound and still dead. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Because the reality on the inside is that if he is truly alive on the inside, there ought to be some telltale signs on the outside of his life. And I just want you to know this morning is that when it comes to a real genuine relationship with Christ, I love what someone has said, is that salvation is the miracle of a moment. The minute you receive Jesus, you're saved. But transformation is the work of a lifetime. God not only wants to set us free, from the penalty of sin. Yeah. But do you realize God wants to and he can deliver us from the power, the power, the power of sin? And what was going on here in the passage, yes, Lazarus, the dead man came out, but he was completely wrapped up, as I mentioned, in these grave clothes. And Jesus wanted him to no longer be bound, no longer be controlled, no longer be uh, enslaved by that which was hindering him. And in the same way, the spiritual application this morning is that so often in our walk with God, did you know just like those grave clothes hindered him, tied him up, bound him, kept him from walking freely like he ought to walk, kept him from seeing as he ought to see, kept him from functioning as he ought to function. Don't you realize sometimes is what the devil wants to do is that if he can't keep me and you from being saved and getting new life, you know what he wants to do? Keep me and you under his thumb, okay? He wants to keep us tied up. He wants to keep us bound. He wants to keep, he wants to keep it enslaving us and controlling us and dominating us. And in what transformation is, is that transformation is that over a period of time, God wants to progressively deliver us from those negative behaviors, from those habits, from those attitudes, from whatever would hinder us in our walk with God. Matter of fact, matter of fact, uh, uh, when, when uh, uh, I think about Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, the, the word of God, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verse 1, it begins to mention sin. We are therefore compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us do what? Lay us, watch this now, watch this. See, see this? Do what? Lay aside the what? Wait. And what? The sin with what? Though easily does what? In snares us. Oh, uh, and then he says what? And let us what? Run with endurance the race that is set before us. Notice, uh, we believe it's most of us uh, believe it was Paul who wrote Hebrews, and, and he says, let us do what? Lay aside. See, Jesus wanted uh, those grave clothes to come off of Lazarus. He wanted the stuff to come off of 
of him. He wanted the stuff to come off of him that was hindering him from moving forward in life. And the word of God says the land of sight, even as Lazarus, uh, the issue was bringing the cloth off of his face, even as there was the unbinding of the stuff that had his hands tied up, even as there was the undoing of that which was tripping him up, God wants us to lay aside the weight. The picture there's a race. You know how it is when a runner, sometimes a runner, especially in long distance, they will train by putting weights on the ankle. The weight is good for training, but no good for running, okay? When it comes to baseball, you know there would be a weighted collar at times put on the end of the bat. Good for building strength, but you don't go to the, uh, to the base uh, to hit with it. You've got to get rid of the weights. So often in our life, we have weights in our lives that may or may not be sinful. Watch this. But the they just hinder you. They hold you down. They keep tripping you up. And it says, which the what so easily beset you. And if we are honest, all of us have what we want to call besetting uh, sins or weights. In other words, what may trip me up may not trip you up. What may trip you up may not trip me up. And so sometimes there are habits in our lives that just keep, we, we talking about you tripping. Well, I want you to let you know the real kind of tripping. So often we allow certain behaviors, certain habits, certain attitudes to trip us up. And not only are there certain habits, attitudes that trip us up, but also there are actual sins now. There are sins that, 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 that dominated and controlled your life before you got saved. Listen. And certain sins in our life, certain patterns in our life, that dominated and controlled our lives before we received Jesus Christ. But the devil is also what the devil loves to do. If he cannot keep me and you from coming to Christ and receiving salvation, he still wants to be our master, as it were. Is that right? And you know what the devil wants to do? Uh, whether it's that behavior, whether it's that pattern, whether it's that addiction, whether, it, whether it's in your relationship with the opposite sex, whether it's how you uh, see yourself. See, sometimes it's, you know, it may not be the issue of who you're sleeping with, but often it is, you know, what you think about yourself uh, when you are sleeping. Let me, let me make that clear. This is what I mean. Sometimes it may have nothing to do with the wrong relationship, but sometimes you know what the enemy uh, would do. No, you may not kill. You may not steal. You may not curse. You may not uh, drink and may not do this or that, but so often you know what the devil does? But sometimes the weight in our life, we struggle with low self-esteem. We struggle with thinking, yeah, it's dangerous to think more highly of your yourself than you ought to, but you know what the devil would do? Some folks think more lowly of themselves ought to. And God has called you to do something. And God has said do it. And you thinking you cannot. And so whether the enemy is attacking you through a low self-esteem or the devil is attacking you through a behavior in your life, God wants to set us free this morning. God wants us to live victorious lives this morning. God my friend, he wants us to live transformed, not so much perfect lives. Let me make this clear. Not so much perfect lives. But do you see the word here? Progressive. And you know what progressive means? Is it over 